Are you looking for a fun and informative podcast all about training working dogs? Look no further than the LWDG Pod Dog. This weekly show is hosted by me, Joanne Perrot, founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group, and I chat to experienced trainers and experts in the field who will give you helpful tips and advice. Whether you're just getting started or you've been working dogs for years, this podcast will have something for you. So pull up a chair, pour yourself a cup of coffee, and tune in to LWDG Pod Dog, and let us help you build a better bond with your best friend. Hello and welcome to another episode of LWDG Pod Dog. This week we're going to be talking about arousal in working dogs. There's loads of conversations about this at the moment, but we're going to be looking at the difference between drive and arousal and how both can affect our dogs, both positively and negatively. Joining me this week are the amazing LWDG group expert Claire Denya and the amazing LWDG featured expert John Denya. How are you both? Great, thank you, Joe. Yep, very good, thank you, Joe. Very excited for this topic today. Now, I do feel this is going to be one of those sort of not contentious conversations because we don't try to be contentious, but these are one of the conversations that there's a lot of confusion around, isn't there? Like, should my dog be over threshold? Should I keep my dog under threshold? Am I thinking about drive? Am I thinking about arousal? There's so many words out there, so much terminology that there is a lot of confusion behind there, isn't there? There's a lot of confusion around it and the thing is yet again as we've mentioned in other podcasts about other subjects terminology is the thing that creates a lot of the confusion and people's interpretation of some of the ter- terminology as well so I thought a good way to start would be to actually I googled arousal in dogs to see what the google definition of arousal in dogs actually meant because I thought A lot of people, that's the first thing they'll do. If they're not asking on a Facebook forum, they're Googling. So I thought, let's just have a look and see what people are finding when they do that. So in Google, um, the term arousal refers to a dog's level of excitement and mental control, which I thought was quite a broad thing to have as a statement about it. Um, Because, again, people's interpretation of mental control and excitement can be very varied yeah there's two terms there very very important excitement that's the arousal piece and mental control without that mental control um there is no threshold there, there is no keeping a dog at a certain level and uh, they must um develop that level of control themselves and that's where i think most people go wrong when they're t- talking about a dog being over threshold there's no such thing as over threshold um, that dog has got too excited for itself to be able to control. Mm. I, and that's exactly it. And I think when we talk about teaching dogs self-control um, and steadiness and how those two separate entities are so interlinked, when you say my dog's over threshold, all you're really talking about is your dog's level of excitement has gone up. Is that how you would explain it to a person, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's pure. Purely that level of focus, that level of motivation, either on a particular object or subject or on performing a particular action. So but if you think about the Google definition, in some ways the same could be applied to what is driving a working dog. Yeah. Yeah, they are almost interchangeable. Yeah. Um, some drives are obviously going to be very useful. Drive to go and retrieve is fantastic but it might mean that you've got to train that so a dog can be steady for you. But a drive to go and chase sheep, that's not something that you're going to want there at all Mm. Um, or something that you're going to need to have a lot of control over. So, um, yeah, the the word arousal and drive, I think, are pretty much interchangeable. It's just I think people tend to focus on drive as being kind of the positive side of it, a dog that really wants to do the thing that they want them to do. Um, whereas um, arousal is always spoken about in kind of a a negative connotation. The dog's too aroused to do this, and it's too aroused to concentrate on that. Where actually, if we really make this really simple, if we can take a dog's excitement or arousal and we can put control mechanisms into that, so steadiness being an example of that, 
um, drive, we have drive in the dog, but it's controlled. So technically, you are saying that drive is controlled arousal, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Where do you think this sort of like confusion has all come from? So over aroused dogs, I think, is when the dog has so over aroused dogs or dogs that people um, describe as over threshold are dogs that have lost control. John? Yeah, if if you used to put it another way, you know, one of the things that everybody looks for in a in a good working dog is a dog that's biddable. Now, for a dog to be biddable, it has to have a little bit of control in, in what it does. Mm. Uh, yeah, having um, a dog that is highly aroused is fantastic. If you want a fast car, you want a fast car that you can rev away with the brake on. And when you take the brake off, it goes like a rocket. Um, you don't want to just take the engine out of the car so it doesn't go so fast or doesn't want to go so fast. Um, so it is about that element of control in there. I think one of the biggest problems is people don't train their dog correctly at a young age so that the dog learns to control that level of arousal. So to be able to switch it on and go and have that break, that foot on the brake until they're ready and until they're told to go. Yeah, it's very, very simple uh, if you don't rush it. Most people have the ability to teach their dog to sit and wait while they serve their food up and put the food bowl on the floor. That's the dog showing a certain level of self-control. It's being told to do something. It desperately wants to have the food, but it learns very quickly and early on. If I sit here, then I will get given that food. So it sits there. Some dogs will actually sit, sit there drooling or shaking, desperate to get to the food bowl. It's but, aroused. But they're aroused. <laughs> they're aroused by food. That's the, the particular subject they're interested in at that point in time. But the dogs are showing the ability to be able to do that. And that's at a very early stage. Most dogs can learn that kind of skill. And it's just developing that very slowly and in a manner of different ways and in different places. So you prove it just like any other skill. And I suppose also when you look at when things go wrong in training, let's say a dog that is termed over aroused and the owner is restricting that dog's ability to do something that really wants to do. What we actually see is frustration. So you see frustration because the dog's being prevented to do what it wants to do when it's in that very aroused state. Does does that make sense, Joe? Yeah, completely. And I think terminology can be our best friend, but also our worst enemy. But the more we break things down in our own minds and sort of set it in stone, the more helpful the terminology becomes. If we don't completely understand it, what I think happens is we throw it around. And I know that I've been one to do that, um, training my own dogs. You throw it around without really understanding what it is you're saying about your dog so for example where you've just said about frustration yeah my dogs when they've been not completely listening have probably been more frustrated that they've had to wait than they have been over threshold because on the first two sort of retrieves they've maintained that level of self-control quite easily as they've got more excited as they've got more frustrated than they've been made to wait for the next one that's when you see this sort of like running in behavior. So do you think that for most people, it's not understanding what it is the dog is completely showing them? Yeah, very, very often that is the case or people over worrying about what they're seeing. So if I give a really, a really easy to understand example of that, I want my dog and it's retrieving or working or competing to have drive, okay? Without drive, my dog will be lacklustre. It won't be interested. It might switch off and not be focused on what it's doing. I want my dog to have controlled arousal, which is drive, to give it the ability to do something stylishly with pace. You know when you talk about these dogs that you watch work and they look really stylish, whether that be when they're hunting or retrieving, they look stylish, they've got drive, they've, they're committed to the job. That dog is in a state of arousal in that point. We wouldn't want to take the dog out of that because then what you'd see is a dog that looked flat and that didn't have that style and didn't have that pace. So, so we're taking that arousal and we're harnessing it. And part of that, we have to train the dog to be able to cope. So we have to teach the dog. And I believe we spoke about this either in a masterclass or another podcast or maybe both. Um, we have to teach the dog how to cope with coming up into a state of arousal and then down again and bringing it up and bringing it down again. Does that help? 
It definitely does. I think it was two weekends ago at um, a game fair, I watched a lady with a clumber spaniel doing um, the pickup. And the dog, bless his beautiful little heart, there was there was no drive that could be compared to like an a Springer Spaniel. Uh -huh. He plodded out. I, I'll say he, he may have been a she. Apologies if he was. He plodded out and did his job, and he was he was almost like hair and tortoise compared to an ESS. And I sat watching him, and I thought, why don't we all buy them? <laughs> because <laughs> he, he literally was just. Doing his job, doing his thing, and I thought, what a beautiful beating dog, just nice and calm and nice and steady. But what this is for, sort of for me that example of we want a lot of us look for the drive, don't we? A lot of us, even the lady going in was making like lovely, beautiful jokes about a beautiful dog, about <laughs> don't expect him to be fast and stuff like this. And I just thought, we all love them, but they it's that drive we look, that control, that harnessed drive. I think this is where if you if you listen to some of the information on my reluctant retriever masterclass and I'm talking about putting drive in and building desire and all of those things all breeds will vary in what it is that they find exciting what it is that they find arousing um some it's hunting some it's the retrieve you know but even within breeds yes with specific breeds you're going to get variations in stuff like that but it isn't just that, even it can be early parts of training. So early, too early steadiness, you know, putting that steadiness in too early and too young with a dog that maybe doesn't have quite, quite such a high level of excitement and drive for retrieving. Would, would you want to add to that? Yeah, the, the more control you put in early, the more, if you think about it, the fun you're taking out of of it so yeah you're making it a less arousing activity and if you've got a dog that you want to be a lot quicker then you don't want to have too much control you want your dog developing that idea that this is fun this is what i want to do mm. you know as claire's definition said it was a level of excitement and a level of control um, and that excitement needs to be there um, for me personally i'm not particularly competitive so um, I don't need to have the quickest dog there is there. I want a dog that wants to listen to me and wants to get on and do the job. So that clump of Spaniel, absolutely perfect for me. Off you go, pal. <laughs> Goes and does it. I'm, I'm always one step ahead of him. I'm not too quick myself. So I'm always one step ahead of the dog. Uh, and, the, and we get the job done. That's more than enough for me. But I think uh, quite often you are looking at these competitive monsters. They've come from very good trialing lines where that's been bred into them over and over and over. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's like going out and buying a Ferrari for your first car. You've still got to be able to control that the same as you can the little Nissan Micra. Mm. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you always hear the, the older chaps when you like, when they're giving you their wisdom, when you're like lost your dog for the 50th time, saying to you, you can't put, you can't put the hunt into the dog. You can put the steadiness in later when they're trying to calm you down, bless them. But it's, it is that, isn't it? Like you said, if the that keenness, that excitement, you don't want to diminish that. You just need to be calm over time. I think I've learned that a lot of people were so determined to get to keep that sort of drive, that fizziness, that over arousal or under arousal or controlled arousal there. Um but we want it in an instant. We're not, we're not prepared to wait to teach the dog the balance, you know. Because on one hand, we're saying, yeah, yeah, we want you to go like, you know, like go the, like the clappers, get that a retrieve, bring it back to us, be quick, be stylish, be all these things. But we'd like you to do it as we want it, straight away. And that's a lot to ask of a very young dog. Yeah, no, it really is. It really, really is. Like, and this is the thing, you know, this is why every dog you've got to train that dog very individually as to its needs so if you've got a dog that really doesn't seem to have a great amount of drive in a certain area you might like let's take retrieving as an example so you might take the brakes off the dog give it informal retrieves let it run in let it develop a bit of enthusiasm whereas if you've got a young dog that is literally you know really really aroused from the day one that you introduce retreat it's almost stamping its feet with anticipation the tongue's hanging out you know all of those signs that 
your dog is really excited and really aroused about this, you might put your steadiness in a little bit earlier with a dog like that because you don't want the dog to form a habit of running in. So it is literally taking each dog independently and saying, what does this dog have? What does it need? What do I need to build on? What do I need to pull back on? But it's them recognising when the dog's arousal is out of control, which is when you're more likely going to get frustration or you're going to get barking or you're going to get jumping up or spinning on the lead and see generally a lack of self-control, a lack of impulse control with that dog. So they're the sorts of they're the sorts of things to look out for when the dog has completely lost its mind in arousal and it's training the dog to be able to contain that. I think people are always really shocked when they sign up for the hot mess handler to find the, you know, our second and third lessons, one is self-control um and once it's one is steadiness you know it's like from the beginning we try to teach what you're looking for in the end yeah always have the end in mind with what you're training yeah you provide those tools early on this is what you're going to need uh, for dog training i always see it more as an art form than an exact science so experience goes a long way or having a, an experienced um teacher that can tell you what you need to be doing when you know the, your color palette's exactly the same for every single dog but you need to know what what to uh, adjust to get the best out of that dog there yeah i absolutely agree with that so what do you think is causing we've seen it in in our group in other groups and i think a lot of our podcasts are directed should i say by what we see in that maybe we want to talk about in more depth far more than we could talk about in a few you know in a few words as a as a comment where do you think the sort of concept of keeping them under arousal constantly removing them from exciting environments and going back all the time where is that coming from Okay, so John might have different ideas on this than me, but where I think it's coming from is people are trying to avoid training the dog for those situations, okay? It's management as opposed to training. So we talk about this a lot. Management is absolutely part of training. You know, when you're training a puppy or a young dog or you're modifying behaviour, management of situations, management of environments, management of the dog's behaviour is part of training. But that isn't training. It's just one tiny little part of it. So if we're avoiding taking dogs into these environments, taking them into situations and educating them, the dog will always be unable to cope. So I think a lot of this is people thinking that management is training rather than using management as part of their training program. The other part of the training program has to be able to teach the dog the ability to cope in situations, to cope with higher levels of arousal and to teach it how to come back down again. So for me, that's where I think a lot of this is coming from, for, from, coming from in situations or conversations is people are thinking that management is training. John? Yeah, there is most certainly a big element of that. But you also then get um, the idea that maybe I can motivate the dog to want to do something else instead. Uh, but that does nothing to change your dog's desire to do that particular action. So if I have a dog that's very, very food motivated and it wants to retrieve as well, if I wave a bit of food in its face, I might distract it for two minutes, mm. but I haven't actually changed its motivation to get off and do what it wants to do anyway. Um, so it's about training the right things. You've got to teach your dog. Um, it's almost like when it's appropriate. It's not that it's not appropriate. It's when it's appropriate to behave in a particular manner. So having that high level of arousal or that high level of drive, absolutely fantastic. But you have that when I tell you um, that it's appropriate, not just hopefully I can make you sit and wind you up even more with food because now not only are you aroused to try and get off and, <laughs> and go and get the retrieve, but now you desperately want to get what's in my hand as well. And you're quite, and most dogs will quite happily take both. Yeah. The minute that food's gone, they'll be off. Uh, you haven't done anything to train them not to do uh, uh, that retrieve, not to run in. Uh, or to lower that arousal level at that point in time 
um, and to hold it together themselves. So what you're describing is distracting techniques. Yeah, so I spoke about management and you're saying distractions is, is another mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, but again, distracting the dog is part of the training in some circumstances, right? Yeah, if we were doing um, a stay, you know, you've got those, those three Ds, yeah. distance, distraction, and duration. That's part and parcel of it, but you have, it's only one little piece that you've got mm. to deal with. So, you know, you, if you're distracting a dog, that's great, but the, the distraction is only going to last for a certain amount of time. They've got to control themselves. And you're far better off that the distraction that you're training against is the retrieve or the thing that the dog wants, training them to put up with that being there rather than to just move their focus to something else. Yeah, because if we keep on taking them back to areas where they're under threshold, like for example, back to the house, back to the garden, because every time they go outside of the garden, they, they're losing it. You're just gonna end up with a dog that will never leave the garden because it's going to have to step outside and it's going to have to learn to control its drive, its threshold, whatever we're calling it, outside of that gate as much as it can control it inside of the gate. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think this is what we're saying when jo when John's talking about using food as a distraction. There, that's only going to work for as long as that distraction is there, or for as long as that distraction outweighs the other thing, the other whether it be a dog or a person or the environment or birds flying up. That's only going to work temporarily or until that's not there anymore. But then you're back to square one because you haven't actually taught the dog anything. Um, and the same with management. If you want to keep your dog on a long line for the rest of your life, um, you know, I don't think many people genuinely want to keep their dog on a long line for the rest of their lives. But it's part of management. It's part of, part of educating the dog. But we have to actually get the dogs out and about and into these environments, even if it's just for five minutes um, and you just do something really easy that the dog can do really quite easily, successfully once and you go, Bingo, that was a little win. We'll take that one. Now let's go and do something in a much easier area where I know you can relax a bit more. So, yes, and, and that's part of stretching the dog. And it's also part of proofing your training. If you can only train those things in your garden or in the house or in your private thing that you rent once a week if you've only got it there you're not really proofing the training so part of getting the dog out into other environments um, and teaching them those behaviors and those exercises in those other areas is proofing which is so important if you think about it like even i think it was last week on a personal note i sent you a picture of the two spaniels laying on my feet in on the deck in in like a little coffee shop now we were only there 15 minutes to me you have, you have all taught me that that little bit that little bit of training that little bit of having them really calm in a, in a really busy environment with bikes and everything else going past is a win and i think a lot of people think little tiny things like that aren't wins but they absolutely are you don't need to for example, had I taken them out and tried to go to that coffee shop and then walk them round a lake with like 500 people and birds and everything else, I would have probably had a really tough afternoon. But just taking them, having that like hot chocolate, putting them back in the car, I was like, that was enough. We had a good time. It was a calm time. You guys behaved beautifully. Now we go do that again in a few days time and a few days time there is no rush to get this i just need to keep on reinforcing to you guys that's the behavior i want yeah yeah absolutely yeah and, and that's it though it's taking those little wins and going okay that's a stepping stone now now the next bit and continuing to grow and develop on that i think the thing is as well joe even when people do get out and get a little win they then think they've achieved the ultimate goal and then rather than go for another little win or another stepping stone, they think they're done. Then when it goes wrong, they feel like the process hasn't worked. So actually, it's like, well, no, but you didn't actually train for that. Just because your dog managed that in that situation doesn't mean it can achieve that in that situation. 
And, and again, that goes back to the proofing of those behaviours and, and making sure the dog is set up for success. But we have to actually educate the dog on this. We can't, we can't wrap them in cotton wool and keep them away from life forever. I think, like, even the example I've just given of the coffee shop, I've learned all that from dog and duck. I listen to you guys We where people ask lots of questions because I think a lot of questions that we have, actually, if you boil them down to what the question was, it, it, this is the question, isn't it? My dog gets wound up when I do this. How do I get control of this? And you all keep on giving the same advice in different, different ways of how to do that, which is this little bit of a little bit of exposure and then back a little bit of training then back not this constant like thinking you're going to win in a second because you're not because this is already a problem yeah problems take time to fix a hundred percent i think also people so yeah you've got all of that element where you've got your 3ds and you've got your proofing the training and all of those things which is super important but also recognizing your little wins and then and then continuing but also i think people don't always understand a dog that's steady doesn't mean it's not aroused i think a lot of people think that dog's a really steady dog and then they look at the dog that's clearly over excited so over aroused who's losing its marbles a little bit and they go, oh, that dog's too aroused. But the dog that's sitting steady is also aroused. For it to have drive and to have desire, there has to be some arousal there. But it's just managed by the dog. Self-management, so that's your self-control element. So arousal doesn't mean you're looking for something where a dog's losing itself completely. It could be that the dog is sitting there completely focused on where they think it's going to be sent that retrieve, but it's still aroused. <laughs> it's just that it's been taught self-control and it can hold it together. Whereas people, you, when they talk about, so when you said about the conversations on the Facebook pages and things like that, um, over aroused dog behavior looks very different to when we're just saying the dog is, the dog is got drive, it's ready, it's focused. It's still in arousal, it's just that it's got self-control. Yeah, if I, if I was to take um, Duke to a shoot and sit him up and then put a sausage in front of his face... He'd turn it his nose he, you know, he, He'll just look at me and go, look, you're blocking my view. <laughs> <laughs> but he's that aroused for what he wants, but he's controlling himself. He's sat there waiting on um, the activity that's going to occur, where he's going to get his reward when he's told, now it's your turn to go get it. And from what Claire was saying there about management and you know, this idea of take them out of that, uh, take them away from there, put them in another postcode. You know, there, there are elements when that is appropriate, but yeah. it's when your dog's not ready for that environment. You haven't trained to that level. If you've got 20 stepping stones and you've done the first one and then you go and jump to the 20th one, you haven't done that work in between. You've not worked your way up there. So certainly if your dog couldn't do the work at the fifth stepping stone, there's no point of being at the 20th. You've got to take them back a little bit and go, okay, now this is what you're capable of. Now we'll push on a bit. Now we'll push on a bit. And the same if you're learning a brand new skill. A lot of the time, you know, people will say that your dog, um, they need to teach their dog to sit there when um, there's some activity going on. Your dog already knows how to sit. They don't have to be taken out of that environment <laughs> to learn how to sit. But if you were training something completely new, uh, if you want to take, teach your dog to hunt for you, uh, and control its hunting. You don't want to start off hunting where there are rabbits everywhere. You've got to take them out of that environment so you can actually teach the hunting skill, the piece you want first, and then gradually integrate that with the rabbits so you're taking that stepping stone forward each time. Yeah. I want to add to that, actually, because some of the best training that I have with Rose, my youngest dog, is when she's in a state of arousal. She's She's got steadiness. She's a really steady little dog but she can very easily become what I call too steady and almost switch off because she's like, well, yeah, well, I've just got to wait now till, but when I'm sending her on more challenging retrieves, blind retrieves, I need her in a state of arousal so that I know she's going to go out with purpose. So that's me then using arousal to my benefit to get the best out of her in training. 
Um, so I will get her a little bit G'd up and a little bit excited before we start, then bring her back down a level to make sure I've got control. Then I set her up. So I'm using arousal to my benefit to get her to have confidence and drive in, in situations where perhaps she might otherwise hesitate. Does that make sense? A way of the sort of con- or the sort of idea of keeping them under threshold or keeping them in one place or taking them back to your garden all the time. The, that can be incredibly damaging, kind of, because it means that the dog will only have confidence around you in a familiar space. The minute you take it out of that space, it's going to lose any confidence it has or any... Um, that's where your training is going to fall apart because the dog is going to lose it because it feels in such an unfamiliar territory. Yes, 100%, yeah. And, and it's just not good for the dogs, you know. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, my dog having that much restriction on what they can cope with in life. That's not good for a dog to be in that state. I, like you said, you'd rather see a dog overexcited and having to learn about new environments and over time get used to being in different environments all the time is not, you know, not going to be an issue rather than always in the garden, can't take them out, lose the lose their head. You know, at that point, it goes from just being a training issue to being a behavioural issue. You're going to need to work on fundamentally changing a dog's behaviour. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Desensitising them, getting them used to that environment, just that habituation goes a long, long way in your training. Now, you might not be able to have your dog off lead in that area to begin with, they need to get they might need to get used to the sights and smells we'll often recommend that people take their young dogs um, around the perimeter of, of um, a shoot or they'll get involved slightly but they're not going to be having their dog doing any work the dog is just getting used to the idea that there's a lot of activity goes on there there's a lot of new smells around that area but they've got them there under control learning that actually just because i'm somewhere new doesn't mean i behave in a different manner and this idea of you're going to need to constantly go through this with your dog where go somewhere new it gets super excited and then you can build that is really really important because like you said when you actually do take that dog to a shoot and there's the sounds and the smell and the live birds all the work you would have done previously in taking it to different places getting it used to settling after a little bit of time that's going to be so important because you're definitely going to bring every single dog back under control. I've not yet seen a dog, even the best of dogs, when they go out and they're on a shoot for a little bit, they like, they hyper, they wound. They can't wait to do their job. So no. that, that training is so essential then, isn't it? It is, yeah. Absolutely. It, it's so, so essential. And also, just um, I just thought of something else just popped into my head then when we're talking. Um, also, very often, you know you hear trainers quite often say to people or they give advice on forums and they go, you've got to make yourself more exciting than the environment, more exciting than the other dog and that, that kind of thing. And people go, how? So... <laughs> that that's kind of setting people up to fail that comment if it's just thrown out there without explanation but for me the, the way that I do that with my dogs is I teach them through the power of play with me with specific toys and specific items to have fun with me and then teach them to come back down a level, observe the environment, observe this, have a look at that. Good, now look back at me. Right, well done, that was brilliant. Get the toy out again, have a quick play. So you're teaching the dog. You can see all this great stuff. You can observe that. And, oh, look, there's a person over there. But, hey, look what I've got. But you have to build that and you have to build that, build that desire to play with a specific toy. But you've got to work out what, do- what floats the dog's boat and then you use arousal with that item to build that play with you to get that kind of response from your dog. So very often what I say to people with recall problems is you're recalling your dog. It's coming in. You're just giving it a pat on the head and giving it a bit of cookie. And the dog's like, are you joking me? I've just come away from 
all that fun over there. I've come here, you've patted me on the head and given me a bit of a cookie. And the dog starts to see that you're not that much fun at all. So I sort of say to people, build this desire to play, build this desire to interact with you and use that to reward your recall instead because the dog needs to have a real value in being with you and you can use building arousal in a toy to your benefit in that way. Do you want to add to that, John? If if you're out and you're working your dog, your dog is still playing with you. There's a bit more distance in it and there are a few different rules in it, but it's exactly the same. The two of you are out together. The dog isn't off on their own, uh, over aroused, just doing their own thing. They, they should be out. And when you ask them to do something or you say, right, now it's your turn, you're in the woods, it's your turn, you go and do your thing. The dog knows it has a strict set of rules um, for a particular game that it's playing with you. And, it's, and at that point, it's the dog's got to go do its hunting. As soon as it's found something, it comes back. If we've got a dog that's got plenty of drive, that's the dog you want in that situation. You don't want it to, to just pop its head into the woods, have a quick look around, come back out and go, nah, it's not there, I couldn't find it. <laughs> you want your dog that's in there trying to get that job done until the point where you say, okay, that's enough, we're moving on, it's not there. Um, and that, you know, that's when you're using that kind of drive to your advantage. It is really hard to be more exciting than the environment because yes. <laughs> there is so much going on. There are so much, uh, so many smells, like even like with our dogs on a farm, there's loads of rabbit smells. They used to some bird smells, everything like that. But then when you go on to a shoot, it's concentrated, isn't it? There's concentrated amounts of animal smells and scents in one area, plus the added benefit to the dog of, oh God, I get to see them as well. Um, so all the work that we do beforehand, taking them into environments that are very exciting, but then us playing with them, like Claire said, doing stuff with them, getting them used to the idea of coming back to us, all that stuff says, even when we're in the most exciting environment, if mum or dad calls, I'm going back, because that's going to be exciting too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you've you've laid that groundwork. You've set the idea in the dog's head already. And you're using arousal to your benefit in that moment. Yeah, so our, or the thought concept of keep on bringing them under threshold, under arousal, under under drive. You don't hear people saying under drive, but basically this all kind of comes back to roughly the same. That's not always going to be the answer. There is a time for calming your dog down, but there's not a time to constantly calm your dog down to the point where it's not learning to cope with being the other end of that spectrum. Yeah, it's learning to understand how to use arousal to your benefit in your training and in your education with your dog and how to train them to come up and down through arousal levels and teaching them self-control and steadiness so that you have control over your dog even when it is in a state of arousal rather than avoiding arousal altogether it's thinking about arousal different differently and how we can use it to benefit the dog instead of you know thinking that your dog cannot possibly ever be aroused i think like if you look at for example if you just go on youtube and watch a trial in dog they walk up with their hand and they look so calm. There's, they just look like they're going for a walk. Yeah. They literally start their job and they go up a million paces. They come back, deliver to hand and switch pretty much back off. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you see the dogs and the rails, are, they're excited by something. That's a reward for that dog to be able to do it. So uh, these dogs that, as you say, um, you know, they walk up very calmly. They've learned that if I do that, I will get this thing that I really want. Yeah. Um, so you're using that arousal as a motivator for the dog. It's a reward for them. Most of the dogs that we work with, after about four or five months, the things that reward them are the intrinsically rewarding activities, the running, jumping, swimming, chasing, hunting, all of those carrying things, depending on the breed. They're the things that your dog really wants to do. That's what a reward is for your dog. Mm. So you're just putting a boundary around that. Okay, you can do this when you've done that. And when the dogs get it, you know, they're they're sat there and they'll be shaking, ready to go, but they control themselves because they know it's a reward for doing a piece of work first. It's not just that take, take, take. They have that element of control in there. 
If you think of it from like a human perspective though, like when we were younger, the, the concept of going to the park and flying around on swings and slides was like the best thing ever. If somebody says to most of us now, do you want to go to the park and go on the swings? We're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways we are, humans are a, a representation of what happens if you constantly keep people or an, a human, an animal, and a threshold. <laughs> can you imagine if you said to a child, you can go to the park, but only if you don't get excited? Yeah. <laughs> they would be like, I don't want to go to the park. That's half the... That's half the... <laughs> 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 when, we went, when we went to Disneyland for last, I was like a clown. I probably was worse than my... My 13-year-old has learned to not look impressed with stuff, which I think... It's part of being a teenager, but I also think a sad part of being a teenager. I was literally running after Mickey, clapping, screaming his name. She was like, Dad, take me away from here. I don't want to be seen in public with her. But I think that's like, with our dogs, if we're going to bring back the sister comparison, we need to do our dogs to always have that excitement for something, don't we? Not to take it out of them. So going back to finishing this, our final thoughts. The conversation we are saying needs to change from getting rid of this arousal more to a management of this arousal so we take them into a higher arousal when it's needed, when it's suitable, but then we also have this off switch of taking them car and calming them back down when that's appropriate too. Absolutely, but I think to recognise that enable to do that, to enable to teach your dog to have arousal to have what we were discussing as controlled arousal, which gives you drive, to be able to teach the dog that and to utilize that to the best way in training, we need to be able to expose the dogs to things and educate them on how to deal with those situations and those environments and not be thinking in our heads, I can't do this with my dog because he gets too excited or because he goes over threshold, but instead be thinking, how can I educate my dog on how to cope with this level of excitement and to teach the dog self-control and work on steadiness, but without losing drive. When we were at the game fair, there were people playing fly ball. Yeah. And I was watching them. Now, that's probably like the most excitable way of taking a dog over threshold. The owners were screaming, the people watching were screaming, everyone was screaming. You the look dog... at agility, yeah, agility, fly ball, but any of those sorts of um, those sorts of activities, the dogs are in, I mean, they are, if you want to call a dog over threshold, that's a dog over threshold, you know, but it's still controlled, right? They're still yes. doing that activity and fulfilling that dog's needs um, without having to keep the dog you know in a really sad state of mind and i think it's a suit like we've been discussing all the way through it's a suitable time for them to be over threshold isn't it it's yeah. a purpose driven arousal um oh, do we have any final thoughts on this because we've done as we always do i love chatting to you too uh, quite a long podcast i hope people have been driving for a very long time or they're going around the block refusing to park <laughs> um <laughs> what are our final thoughts on this for people who um have a dog that they've been worrying or uh, is over threshold and they've been working really, really hard to keep on bringing it under threshold thinking that means take it back to the house don't do anything with it or distract it what can they do to harness that threshold that that arousal is that yeah I, just to begin with you've got to be able to teach your dog there's a time and a place for a particular behavior um, so you may need to take them just out of that environment once or twice so they can learn that when i do this this is what follows and then at the same time you want to teach your dog to have that element of self-control. And that doesn't have to be self-control in that particular environment with that one particular activity. More often than not, when we see a dog that um, is losing it, let's say they run in on every single dummy, there are plenty of things that that dog will do um, that the owner either doesn't want them to do or they ask them to do something and their dog does something completely different. Just almost laying that first foundation, that little nugget that the dog goes, oh, okay, I need to do something if you ask me for it, and then I get to benefit from it. Yeah, it, um, I think dogs always seem to be uh, rather hedonistic, 
you know, if this is fun, that's it. That's what I'm going to do to the detriment of everything else. This is the most exciting thing in the world. And it's just teaching them that actually you can have this and you can do that, but you have to do it when I say so or with these particular boundaries around them. I would agree with that because, what you know, a lot of the time as a trainer um, and we get people contact us, we, we might say, okay, so you can't just avoid this forever. We need to get the dog out and we, and we need to, you know, show you how much to how much to get the dog to see and how much to get them into that environment so that you can train effectively so you might it might be that people need a trainer to help them um with those first steps because it can be quite a scary daunting thing if you know your dog loses itself quite easily in certain scenarios getting a trainer to help you teach the dog some self-control um you know, and to disengage from things is is, is likely going to be very useful for you. Um, but also to not be afraid to get out there and try and do things that are easy for your dog to do in more distracting places so that you can see what your dog can achieve rather than just being too frightened to get out there and do it. Yeah. I think for me, one of the best things I've ever learned, and I've learned so much amazing stuff from all of you, but one of the best things I ever learned was the concept of not changing it all at once. So, yeah. like for example, if I take the dogs to a new environment, I try to stay still and let the environment change around me so they're not having to change or deal with the environment changing, the people changing, the animals changing, the scents changing, everything changing. So gradual things and just allowing them a little bit of time to familiarize themselves in their location, familiarize themselves with what's going on around them and then maybe move on. So I'm not blowing their minds with everything all at once. Yeah, I'd agree, but also, don't people shouldn't underestimate their dog's abilities you know I think people really underestimate their dog's abilities but also underestimate their dog's senses like people think they need to be near a shoot for their dog to be able to smell birds and things like that birds are everywhere the dogs and the dog's sense of smell is so incredible that they're picking up on all of that in so many different environments as well so don't underestimate the dog's abilities fantastic well, thank you very much both for another amazing podcast. If you would like to find out more about the Hot Mess Handler, visit our website, www.thelwdg.com. It's open to both men and women. You can take part in over 14 hours of training, a load of homework, over 81 exercises to train your dog. If you are a lady and you're listening to this, please come along also and join us in the membership where you can ask Claire, you can't ask John, sorry, because John's not allowed in because he's a boy. <laughs> you can ask Claire and all the other trainers all your questions and we can help you with your dog. Thank you very much for a wonderful podcast both and thank you all for listening and we look forward to speaking to you all next week. Thank you for listening to LWDG Pod Dog with me, Joe Parrott. Now we all know training a dog takes time, energy and patience, but our lives can be really, really busy. Don't worry, the LWDG has got you covered. Join us for our free planning workshop where we'll show you how to use short 10 minute training sessions each day to fast forward your dog's education. Our experts have years of experience in training dogs and will help you get started on the right foot. Register now and start making progress with your furry friend today. Go to our Facebook page, The Ladies Working Dog Group, and click on the pinned post. Or visit www.thelwdg.com.